and welcome back to the Warwick F1 show. We'll be talking about the race in Imola, the Emilia Romagna made in Italy, the other Italian words Grand Prix. But we will talk about the sprint race. We'll talk about arguably probably the first time one of our title contenders has cracked with Charles Leclerc's uh, spin at Variante Alta. We'll talk Lewis Hamilton. Obviously, rumor he's fighting back against rumors of his retirement, but stuck behind Pierre Gasly for the entire race in what, as a Hamilton fan, was one of the most painful displays of driving I've ever seen in my life. We'll talk about the resurgence of McLaren as well, obviously Lando Norris coming back up. Then we will look at our predictions for the week and then talk Miami. But first, I've got to introduce my guests. Um, on mic two, we have Cam Hall. How are you doing, Cam? Hello, I'm doing very well. Are you doing good? Yes, I am. I'm slightly recovered. So slightly recovered. Me and Will were both at Pop last night and we had a great time. I drank too much. Same. It was painful. But we don't discuss that on air. No, Will. we we are a family friendly um, Christian Christian radio station here. Uh, we've also got Catch as well. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing well. I was also at Pop, so did also have a good time. Yes, I was it, feeling a bit better this morning, but I did not get out of bed to one thirty. So no, yeah, that that was me. Did you go to the um, uh, F1 Society Circle? I did. Ooh, how was your costume? I know the theme was Miami. It was, was good. It? I had a my dad gave me a flamingo shirt for when I came back to uni, so it was a fun time. Okay, and we've also got my ever-dependable co-host, Jim May. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Unfortunately, I didn't go last night because oh. I had a slight foot injury, but, uh, yeah. But, yeah, I'm, as a Red Bull fan, at least last weekend was almost perfect for us. We literally had one point off a perfect weekend, so I'm happy about that. Yeah, and finally, we have Bethany. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks, yeah. Unfortunately, I was unable to go as well, mainly because of the fact that I've just had three exams in four days. So that's been fun. But I've also had the F- the F1 to help me with just with when I needed a break for, from revision. So and, yeah, and to get a quick nap. <laughs> <laughs> How are you alive? Three, three exams in four days. How are you alive? I don't know. That's just the way it was done. Because yeah, I've got another two exams next week as well. Good luck. Oh well, we will quickly go around the guest and as nor as ever, give the race and you know what? Give the weekend a mark out of ten. We'll start with Cam. You see the weekend was good, I would say. The weekend I would say score a solid seven. There was a bit of drama. There was certainly, I think, the rain and qualifying spiced things up. Certainly that mixed up grid. The sprint race was much better than last year's sprint races for sure, I think. Especially, I think, this is what sprint races were all about. Having a bit of a mixed up grid, an opportunity to potentially as well see how that effect go into the race on Sunday as well. A lot of overtaking, I think the extra points were good on that front. So, the weekend, I would say a seven. What's letting it down is the race. If you weren't watching the first ten laps or the last ten laps, you'd have been put off Formula One forever. So, the race, the race is a two out of ten. Okay, catch. I will agree that the weekend was about a seven, seven and a half. I loved the, like, drama with the rain. It, it was great. And the sprint was so engaging. I was watching it in a car. And even despite that, and, like, good views outside, I loved it. Um, I think two's a bit harsh for the race because the start and end were pretty good. Like, if you think it was, what, 63 laps? That was a good 20 laps of good racing, good drama. Start and end, 10 laps each side. So I'd give it, like, a four and a half. Okay. To yeah. me? I think I would agree with the weekend as well. I also give it seven, possibly six and a half, seven. But I think that's just probably the bias from the race. I just did not like the Sunday race. And, but the race, I'll give it three out of ten. I think for me, the bonus point probably just comes from the Red Bull one, two. And mm. um, Bethany, just finish off. I'll be honest. Yeah, the weekend was good. I, I agree with everyone here about around a seven out of ten, though. I think it. Would, I think it's a bit more, a slight more balanced. Certainly not equal in amount in terms of the race was obviously quite boring in places. But at the same time, there were there was a good start, there was a good end, and there was a bit of a storyline continuing through it. And there was the occasional piece of action, even in the boring section. I'd argue. So for that, I'd give it a five, maybe even a six. Okay, and obviously there we've all spoken about the race. We've all spoken about how it possibly could have been better. Like. 
obviously we were coming into this thinking or you come into it on the day thinking there's rain it's a wet start there's more like threat of showers on the horizon it should be a good one i mean catch what what just went wrong with it like do you would do you think there was a reason in particular why we've all put it so like low down rating wise yeah uh, I'm not going to say DRS, but I think it played a big <laughs> factor. The fact that, like, we were, the drivers were on slick tyres for so much of the race, yet there was no DRS until later on. And by that point, it was just inevitable what was going to happen. The main people that needed to overtake, Bar Lewis Hamilton, could overtake. And that, again, was a DRS train. So, I don't know, the, the lack of DRS and then the DRS being put in place did... Yeah, limits so, it. So obviously, Cam, the common like Co- Crofty and um, Paul de Resta on commentary were speaking a lot about how they thought the DRS mm. should have been put in place a lot sooner. I mean, do you, do you, why do why do you think it wasn't almost? I think partly new race directors, maybe a new approach. We've seen, but I mean, we've seen for the last years the DRS has been used in the intermediate when intermediates have been used in the past. I think when you're on dry tires, there's no excuse to not have DRS. So I don't understand what was going on there. I think I agree it was a mistake that was made to not introduce it earlier. Um, I think it's probably just maybe some confusion up at race direction. That's something for Niels Wittek and um, Eduardo Freitas to take forward and learn going forward. Um, I think just on the point, though, of what the overtaking and the issues with that, I think Imola is a track. We saw some great overtaking during the sprint. But I think one of the things we saw without the DRS, and even when we had the DRS and because we had the DRS train, because Imola is very narrow, You've got one line through the Tamborello chicane. You've got one line through Villeneuve. So effectively, as, as we were seeing with Pierre Gasly, consistently with Lewis Hamilton, provided Gasly had that inside line going into Tamborello and had the inside line going into Villeneuve, whatever the DRS, Hamilton couldn't do anything because there's just one line through those corners because of how narrow Imola is. So I think the track played a part in this as well. In a way that it didn't with the sprint, the DRS was used throughout most of that and the moves were being started a lot earlier earlier as well but that was when there were none of these drs trains where you literally have one car behind the other you know when we saw a Charles Leclerc, for example where there was that big advantage in car performance by the end of the race that was where the overtakes were happening and that was when the drs was no train there were no trains as well but when you have similar car performance and then you've got the situation where Imola's so narrow there's one line through the corner drs even then is going to struggle to be effective i mean chimo do you think that Almost maybe the rain hindered it, hindered the race as opposed to helping it or hindered the racing at Imola in particular. Obviously Cam's saying there, it's such a narrow track and when you get onto, when you get onto the wet part of the track with slick tyres on, there's a high chance you're just going to go sailing along. So if there is just that one dry line, it makes it very difficult to overtake. Oh yeah, I 100% agree with that and I think also because of what happened last year with Bottas and Russell and Russell had DRS and he ended up on a wet patch I think he was on grass though but mm. I think with, uh, especially with that wet patch I think that kind of may put a bit more fear in the race directors to actually activate DRS that early on and probably wanted the track to properly dry on instead of keeping a bit moist and activating it yeah and um, I'll come to you Bethany finally just about the race do you think that if there had been more rain if it had been like a wet dry maybe back to wet race it would have been a better one or do you think that there was uh maybe was there anything else that could have been done to improve it um as chime said i think that it was a combination i think there was a combination of the race directors being more new to formula one and therefore being more cautious and also the bottas russell c- collision last year that's caused the drs to be turned on late so i I'll be honest, I don't think... I feel like it could have been turned on earlier, but I'm not sure if that would have made much of a difference anyway. If it had been a wet-to-dry-to-wet race, I think we would have seen a lot more strategy, though, and I think that would have been able to make the race much more entertaining. Yeah, so we'll take a quick break, and once we come back, we will talk Charles Leclerc displaying his... Well, the first crack in the 2022 or what is shaping up to be the 2022 title battle welcome back to the warwick f1 show and we will now discuss ferrari it was looking so good for them or at least for one of their drivers until he until he spun off at the variante auto i'm talking about charles leclerc obviously that race 
it was it was a bit of a weird one for Ferrari. We'll come on to Leclerc's teammates, Carlos Sainz, who is having the worst luck apparently of any driver ever. But Leclerc, I mean, Cam, do you think that he was just compromised by that start? I know I saw on Twitter there was um, a metal patch on his starting on his starting position to cover up the previous um, the previous start line. And obviously, we all know metal in metal with water on it very slippery. So, do you think? A small patch of metal maybe cost him that race win. It could have been. Poten- potentially. I mean, I'm not going to... Uh, it is, it, he was still taking a lot more of the kerb than um, a driver normally would through that corner. And there was a simulation I saw someone on the F1 games was doing a simulation taking the Claire's line. He said, whatever you do going through that line, you will inevitably be going to spin off. Because he was so far over the kerb that, yeah, you know, that's very much what that is. So... You know, I think Charles Leclerc, the start as well, look, it, that, it was compromised by the start, that did not help, but, you know, at the end of the day, he, he the fact he fell back so far, you know, he got a little wheel spin off the line, it wasn't a great start from him, I don't think that metal would have done much, and also the FIA wouldn't have cleared it, if that was the case, that it was going to have that big an effect, I do just think it was a bad start from Charles Leclerc, and just in general for him, given what we said was such a perfect weekend in Australia, where it seemed he did everything right. That whole issue with the fastest lap in Australia, where Ferrari were telling him, calm down, don't push for this, you know, I feel maybe we overlooked that a bit too much. And that kind of, I'd say, naivety still somewhat that Charles Leclerc has, as we've seen in Imola, you know, can have an effect and could be, if he doesn't win this championship, could be what stops him doing that. Yeah, obviously, uh, Catch, with that spin costing, it cost him seven points, the gap from third to sixth when he had dropped back to ninth and then recovered after his pit stop. We, we, we are well aware of championships coming down to fine margins like we saw last season. So you'd have to say that these points do matter, and it's, it is a bit of a gift for Red Bull, especially because, obviously, after the first three races, Verstappen in particular was really on the back foot. Oh, 100%. Um, I think, they, as you said, they lost seven points, and that's a lot. And it's, But you've got to consider that Leclerc's spin lost him a place. I think it was one place, maybe two. I'm still up for debate on whether Ferrari needed to actually bring him in or whether he could have got to the end. He dropped down so many positions with bringing him in and giving the pit stop and changing whatever they did. I can't remember now. But it, there's so many fine margins. I think by the end of the season, though, it might not come down to this. I'm not expecting it to be as tight as it was here, as tight as it was in like, other seasons. I think by a bold prediction, I shouldn't be doing this, by a race 21, we'll know who the champion is. Ooh. I, I think it's, something's gonna happen. There's gonna be big, like, proper DNFs losing 25 points, or, I don't know, Red Bull may, their power unit may just die, I don't know. But, yeah, I, I don't think these points will matter too much, but especially with the teammates, so Perez, doing so well and getting those points as well is really gonna help, and science is bad luck is, it's giving Ferrari some concerns possibly, and maybe they might be overthinking that going into Miami. I mean, I'm just looking at the the standings now. Red Bull has closed the gap to Ferrari to now just 11 points. And especially coming after before Imola, when Ferrari was so far ahead, mainly because of all the Red Bull powertrain issues, I think especially reliability is going to play a big factor throughout the rest of the season. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, we mentioned there, or Catch mentioned there, Perez and Sainz and their differing fortunes. And we will come on to Carlos Sainz now, who just can't... I say can't seem to catch a break, but it was sort of of his own making. Obviously, crashing out in qualifying and then in the race, obviously, that's not his fault. Ricardo going into the back of him, spinning him off into the gravel. I mean, Bethany, what what can Carlos Sainz do at the moment? Does he just need to get his head back in the game? Obviously, after two races of um, DNFs and 17 points scoring finishes it's like london buses like when one dnf comes a second (laughs) comes straight after but it it always seems like that doesn't it it always seems like when you get one you get two and do you think that science just needs to get his head back in the game and then um, bring himself back up to help leclerc probably challenge for that title i do think that science has there's been a bit of unluckiness there's been a bit of his fault it's a bit of both in my opinion and i do think that he needs to just get his head back in the game as, as you said 
But also, regarding the incident with Ricardo, I'd argue that that was a racing incident, that Ricardo wasn't at fault. He just, the slippery surface just slid into signs. There wasn't really anything either of them could have done. So, Because the track's so thin and it's so narrow that it could be argued both ways. Mm. I just want to mention a point that I saw um, just on Twitter today. Um, Ferrari and Carlos Sainz bad luck hasn't actually stopped. They took part in the Pirelli tyre test um, and Carlos's power unit failed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it's well for them then. It really is. Carlos, like, even on a week where there's no racing, he, he can't catch a break and I feel bad for him. But yeah. I think he's got to realise that this is not his championship anymore. Or mm. is it lucky that it failed at a test and not at a race? Ooh. Maybe his luck True. turned. And Chime, obviously... It will come down to fine margins, probably, in the end. Obviously, Verstappen getting that Grand Slam, the first time in 43 years that two drivers have got a Grand Slam in the same season. We're, look, we're looking at drivers that are probably at the top of their game at the moment. Realistically, can you see maybe anyone else... Oh, well, I don't... Maybe, yeah, even winning this season without the two of them potentially coming together like we saw last season. Hmm. I think the championship is pretty just much going to be constrained to them too. But yeah, it's not. It's a bit too early to tell, and especially with these new cars, you never know who's going to really win out in this development race. And I mean, especially with this whole weight saving issues going on right now, it'll be it'll be really fun to see who which team really comes out on top with the car. Yeah, it's just there's long time we're only four races into a 21 22 race season i think potentially 23 I think it is they've got a 23 yeah. but i don't know whether russia's got replaced yet it's not got replaced yet but i think it's just to be confirmed right yeah. the shakes just have to work out how much money they're giving for qatar to have the race that's what it is right <laughs> now. <laughs> um but yeah so and it's the first year of a uh, br- brand new regulations it's a massive regulation change so there's got there's going to be a lot of development where we're at the steepest part of the development curve at the moment so who knows what's going to happen by the end by the end of the season Williams could be the fastest team for all we know they won't be just, no but you get my points like yeah. I just it, want to pick up on a point about race wins because obviously apart if Leclerc and Verstappen if they crash obviously someone else will win the race I think when when they do. I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing yeah. to say it, if, if the karting story's true, it's oh going to happen a couple of times this percent. season. It just will happen, though. Yeah. But like, I think statistics. we will see other drivers win on pace. Like, if, I'm not, as a McLaren fan, I'm going to mention this, but seeing when they've come from race one to race four, you never know. Like, Haas could easily win a race with Magnussen. Like, on pace. You never mm-hmm. know what could happen. There's so much development, like everyone said, that I think other drivers will win on pace because Monza. In other instances. While I would like to see a Magnussen win, I do find uh, it's one of my favourite stats that he got a podium at his first race and then hasn't got a podium since. It's brilliant. <laughs> and I almost want to preserve that. But definitely one team that hasn't uh, done well so far in terms of obviously the new regulations. We'll move on to them, Mercedes. It's, oh, it's a painful oh. time it's to be a Lewis Hamilton fan <laughs> right now. It was, it was, it was like I was being punished for something watching 15 laps of Lewis Hamilton stuck behind Pierre Gasly. It, it's just like the penance of having so long of Lewis Hamilton doing so well that we have to be put back down to earth very badly. Yeah. And I mean, Cam, I'll come back to you. Obviously, Hamilton down in, I think, finishing 14th and then moving up to 13th with Esteban Ocon's penalty. George Russell in a very good fourth. Or was it fifth? Fourth. 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 It was yeah. fourth. Uh, George Russell in a very good fourth. Do you think that Hamilton just got unlucky in the race? Obviously, Russell swooping around the outside of that incident between uh, Sainz and Ricardo, getting up to there and sort of sticking there. And then just Hamilton at the back, unable to overtake. Well, you do have to be in the right place at the right time. And George Russell was in the right place at the right time because he was ahead of Lewis Hamilton on the track. And you have to be ahead to take advantage of these kind of things you know you, you've got to be ahead to win to win the race for example so yeah it's kind of it reminded me a little bit of Ocon and Vettel in Hungary last year like you yes right place right time but you've got to be ahead on track to do it so that I think that certainly covers turn one but the thing with Russell is Russell held his own 
when he was up there. Sure, he was going to struggle trying to catch up with Lando Norris, but he held his own with Kevin Magnussen and with Valtteri Bottas throughout the race in a way that Lewis Hamilton was just not doing with Ocon, Gasly, Snowder, both the Aston Martins. You know, he fell back so far, Lewis Hamilton, where, where, the, where there was such a train after the pit stops, the field spread after that was, became concerning. And yeah, Lewis Hamilton, I, he has these bad days, historically. There have been races where Lewis Hamilton has had in the past that have been terrible. But you only tend to get one or one or two of them maximum a season. We've had two in the first four. This is concerning. Mm. And I think he'll find form. The car will get better. But I am slightly concerned because Lewis Hamilton doesn't have these sorts of bad days as frequently as he had recently. Yeah. I think he's had a big confidence knock with these new regulations. The car's much slower compared to the Mercedes normal rivals and just I think he's just had a massive confidence knock and he he's struggling as a result and I think that his poor performance in Imola was a combination of two things first Q2 just the fact that there was a red flag if I remember correctly and as a result just both him and Russell got knocked out in Q2 what first in it? No. It was the first time a Mercedes hadn't got to Q3 since, I want to say, Japan 2012? I believe that is the date, yes. Mm-hmm. Japan 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So, so nine years. First time Mercedes hadn't got into Q3 nine years. I think that that was just part of the problem. So they were on the back foot. George managed to get... A, gets that move in the race that got him towards the front. Hamilton didn't get that, and in fact, I believe he had a really bad start that actually saw him lose places, if I'm correctly. And it was the same with the sprint as well. Like, he fell back at the start of that. And, you know, Lewis, Lewis Hamilton doesn't always have the best of starts. He's had some terrible starts in Formula 1. But it just seems like... And I, I to be honest, I'm not sure he's fully recovered from Abu Dhabi yet. I mean, I don't think anyone, who even the many Lewis Hamilton fans have recovered from I it. Anyone, so I don't think anyone's recovered if Lu- from if Lu- I wouldn't be surprised if he's quite recovered from that yet. But it just seems that all of these little kind of mistakes that Lewis occasionally makes, he's making more frequently. And I think the hardest thing for him, it's not like in 2009 where Heike Kovalainen was his teammate and they were both doing absolutely terrible in the car and the car was giving them nothing until the upgrades came. George Russell is getting... I consistently showing why people are saying the Mercedes is the third fastest car on the grid. Lewis Hamilton is not. And I don't think he's been in this position relative to a teammate. He wasn't with this with Nico Rosberg. Mm. He was never with this with Alonso. This is a weird position for Lewis Hamilton to be so far behind his teammate. And that, I think, is really concerning. Yeah, I mean, I'll come to you, Timmy. I know you wanted to speak. Obviously, Russell... Only driver now with four top five finishes in the first four races. It's a very, it's a weird stat. Like, it's how incredible. Is, how is Russell that person? But Mr. Consistency. He is Mr. Is. Consistency. Obviously, there was that. There were those ideas before the start of the season. I think off the back end of 2021, when Russell wasn't underperforming, but maybe maybe was a victim of how good he was in like the middle middle part of the season obviously at Belgium and at Russia do you think he is de- he, he is delivering now isn't he he is showing that he deserves that Mercedes seat oh yeah 100% i mean if he's at, i mean i know Lewis Hamilton isn't exactly p- performing at Lewis Hamilton standards i think he's falling a victim to his own performance his own standards at the minute but i think George Russell is just definitely delivering what the team needs at this moment which is a very high position scoring positions, especially taking advantage of when Ferrari Red Bull or in last weekend Ferrari had problems and stuff like that. But I mean, probably a theory could be George Russell just used to having a slow car, whereas Lewis Hamilton isn't. <laughs> that, that, that too is it. I, Cause the thing is, George Russell was consistently outperforming that Williams last season. And I guess, I guess you get experience in a situation so maybe Lewis just has to adjust to being in the midfield I mean one thing about the Mercedes which has been their whole design philosophy for the last few years is they design the car based on the fact they're going to be miles in front now Mm. do you think I think they've adopted that same design philosophy this year they're not 
And George Russell coming into the team was like, well, I'm used to having a car like this, so I will outperform it. I'll take it as far as it can go. Whereas Lewis Hamilton, we've always seen whenever he's been in traffic in the past in these Mercedes in the last few years, that's when he has the off days. He's struggling in the traffic. He's struggling in the dirty air. And even with the new cars, I still think there's an element of that. So, yeah, I think Lewis Hamilton's definitely out of his comfort zone in a lot of ways at the moment in a way that George Russell isn't. And I think we're having to see that adjustment from him, definitely. I mean, yeah, catch being out of his comfort zone might be quite literal as well. Obviously, we saw how much the Mercedes was bouncing along the straights. It was mm. ridiculous how it, much it, it, it makes it. your eyes horrible to watch when you're when you're watching the helmet cam sometimes. I mean, if you have a 22-year-old George Russell complaining of back, back pains and what F1 drivers are what meant to be some of the fittest athletes in the world, mm. that says something about how bad the poor person is. I think George is 25. Because Lando's 22 and... No, George and Lando are the same, pretty much are the same they? age, yeah. They're all younglings. Oh, they're don't, all Lewis they're Hamilton. Young. I don't like... Do you know the worst bit? They're, they're, Yuki Tsunoda, I think, is only... I think he's either a few months older than me or like if... Or pretty much, I think, born a couple of weeks after you. I can't remember if he's 2000 or 2001. No, that's the one thing I've got is that I'm younger than all F1 drivers. Still. Yeah, Yuki Tsunoda is a got, few months still older got than me, which is <laughs> distressing. Don't wait till Teo Porcher comes in. Oh, don't, oh, no. don't remind me. It's painful. I'm probably the youngest person in the studio and he's younger than me. <laughs> Where did we go wrong? <laughs> but yeah, catch. Obviously, another issue that the Mercedes seems to have, is, and that uh, one that really seems they seem to be struggling with, is tire warm up. Especially in these uh, wet weather races. Obviously, the track is cooler. The weather is cooler. It's crucial. And we saw how Hamilton came out of the pits, and then he dropped back another two positions. Obviously, Albon and I think Gasly overtaking him yeah. before he could get those tyres up to temperature. You almost think, did Mercedes need to try something different with the strategy? Especially if they knew that when everyone pits, and if they pit after some people, that they're going to be coming out on cold tyres that will take at least half a lap, three quarters of a lap to warm up to working temperature. On P or, and compared to people that have been round for a lap on slick tyres, obviously warmed up, did Mercedes need to do something different rather than following the crowd? They may have. Um, you Like, with the race, obviously, they took a while to warm up. Also, fault in qualifying, they seem to be taking two laps to warm up the tyres. Sometimes in qualifying, they do, and that's why I think they're out of position a lot of places. Um, they could have tried something different, but also McLaren tried to do that with Daniel Ricciardo, and it just did not pay off at all. That may have been a bit of bad luck, I think, going on to the hard tyres a bit early, I think it was. I can't remember exactly what happened, but if they tried something different, they, it would be them accepting that they are not going to be in a points finish. However, I think they assumed that, oh, it's Lewis Hamilton, he will be able to overtake these cars, and it just didn't work. So maybe, again, they were a victim of optimism and thinking this was going to be it would work out, and it didn't. Do you know who was enjoying the race, though, on Sunday? Former world champion Nico Rosberg. Oh, he was having so, He was so annoying. He was, he was loving it. I mean, the thing is, as a pundit, Nico Rosberg, I, I hated him as a driver. As a pundit, I quite like him. He's a good pundit. And I it was him. very, but you could sense, uh, there was a little, there was a bit when he was on Sky after the race. It's not just his commentary yeah. during it, where Sky brought him on and he's like, oh yeah, George Russell's amazing and getting the most out of this car. And Lewis is doing absolutely terribly. And you could just see that wry smile. In there. Because the thing is, I've, there, there's always been that question of, in my mind, of if Nico didn't retire, how many more championships he could have run relative to Lewis. Now, with a competitive, with a more competitive teammate in George Russell showing Lewis Hamilton up at the moment, it makes you think he could have won some more of those titles potentially. And I think Nico is sitting there thinking you'll put him on this pedestal, but you know, George is showing why I was good in a very convoluted and indirect way. I don't like Nico Rosbo being dis discussed here. <laughs> it shouldn't be allowed. Uh, we'll take another quick break, and after the break, we will come back and talk about some of the other finishers in the top 10 before we move on to our discussion of a brand new race, the Miami Grand Prix. Welcome back to the Warwick F1 show, and we are going to move on to the rest of the top 10 
and it was actually quite a mixed up top 10 wasn't it after after um the two at the front after the two red bulls actually getting their first one two since malaysia 2016 which is a really odd thing to think about with the think it'd be sooner you really would yeah i know it just seems like they should have had one a lot sooner than that but behind them lando norris getting his third consecutive podium in italy then in fourth obviously we've had george russell we've discussed him in fifth valtteri bottas that man must be loving life right now. <laughs> He's moved to a team that might actually be better than this old one. Out of absolutely nowhere. It is the ultimate Bottas meme in every sense of the book. You know, you know when you got to the end of his Mercedes days and he clearly didn't care. Maybe he just, this was like his master plan. <laughs> this all just coming true and he can go look at the screen again behind him and just be like, no, I don't care. He did, he's just getting off the simulator after a terrible <laughs> performance. Be like, the car's great, guys. Uh, in sixth, we had Kevin Magnussen. Seventh was Yuki. No, in no. sixth was Charles Leclerc. Oh, yeah. yeah. Magnussen was ninth. <laughs> Were you watching the end of the race, Will? No, I'd fallen asleep by then. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, sixth, Leclerc. Seventh was... Sonoda. Sonoda. Eighth was Vettel. Ninth was Magnussen. Tenth was Lance Well done. Congrats I can I can do this. You I, have memory. I do have memory. <laughs> but we will we'll actually we'll go uh, down the top ten, starting obviously with our third place finisher, Lando Norris, McLaren making a resurgence, or at least one of their drivers is. The other one is punting off Ferraris. Stop! Uh, I don't like this Danny Rick slander. Shut up! Saying, come on, give give my time break. No, to, to be fair with Daniel Ricciardo, he got compromised by what happened on the first lap. He probably would have come around fourth or fifth. Well, yeah, actually, yeah. If he didn't, so, I well, I'll, yeah. I'll stop slandering the honey badger thank you the honey badger is doing better in 2022 than he was in 2021 he just had bad luck we had a good sprint race didn't they he did have a very good sprint yeah. race but yeah lando norris carrying on i think he's i mean his 2022 will not be as impressive as his start to 2021 because that was so good but i think certainly what we're seeing from lando is a good consistency still and when those advantages come lando norris is Sochi last year aside, a driver who's taken every opportunity that comes his way and maximised that advantage. He did it in a, in a, the thing is, I was just thinking throughout that race, you know, I wouldn't have, Lando Norris, if for something did happen to the top three, as it did, I was literally thinking he will get that podium and it's almost an expectation of him now. And that's how, that shows you really just how far he's come and how much of a prospect he is for the future for McLaren. Right, yeah, I mean, that is completely true. Obviously, I'll come to you, Catch. I'll let you wax lyrical about McLaren <laughs> quickly. You. I mean, my McLaren hat, you can't see, but I'm from in my the, hat. I mean, yeah, from the start of the season, it seemed like McLaren would re- were really going to struggle this yes. season, potentially being down with the Aston Martins and the Williams. They've yes. vastly improved. They realistically, I think, probably going to challenge Mercedes this season. The third, in the constructors. Yeah, 100% the third we're place. already seeing it because Norris and Russell, even though they didn't really go toe-to-toe, <laughs> they were challenging for that third-slash-fourth place now in the end. And I think the improvement that McCarran have made is incredible. It's got to be people at the factory. I have no idea how you can go from like back of the grid, everyone was writing them off, people on Twitter changing from McLaren to Ferrari just because they're doing better. Like you you can't you've got to have some loyalty and I think the the progress they've made, they've stuck with the fundamentals of the car that I still think are a bit broken. They may not have designed the car perfectly for these regulations, but they're learning from Red Bull, they're learning from Ferrari. And it's just really incredible to see what's happening. And they're also with Daniel Ricardo not they're not worried to try different strategies, even though it doesn't work out. Like, Danny Rick finished down in 18th, back in the grid. They still try something different, and they got the data. And I think taking the first two races as a chance to use it effectively as testing has just shown it's really improved. I think that's what Mercedes could have done, and they didn't. But, yeah, Lando, as you said, he's consistent. He is Mr. Consistent. He, he will get those points. He will get those podiums. And it is surprising to see him in third. I was pretty anxious the last 10 laps because I did not expect to see him there at all. I was so expecting him to spin out. Um, but no, it's incredible to see. And I think you, it's not the final time I think we'll see McLaren up there. Maybe not challenging up because Leclerc won't make these mistakes and Carlos will get better luck eventually. But seeing them consistently in fifth and sixth, I think 
is expected now. Well, I mean, Lando's got experience of slick tyres on a wet track, hasn't he? He does. He has a lot of experience <laughs> like that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. No, we'll move. We'll move on from McLaren. Obviously, they are looking to now challenge Mercedes for that third place in the championship. We've talked about Bottas. Um, I would say if Verstappen hadn't got a Grand Slam, I would say my driver of the day probably would have been the next driver we're going to talk about, Yuki Tsunoda, mm-hmm. who had the, easily the second best weekend out of any driver on the grid. He had a bit of a, he, Jimmy, I'll come to you, obviously, Red Bull fan, Alpha Tauri, their junior team. He had a tough 2020, obviously ending it really well with his fourth place in Abu Dhabi. The most, the most, I rec- the most overlooked result of the entire season because obviously everything else was going on. Do you think he can, he can use this as a springboard? Because he went from 16th in the, uh, in qualifying up to 7th in the race, 9 positions gained. Do you think he will use it as a springboard, as I said? I think 100%. I think this season, Yuki Suna does really, f- just realised that he actually has to put a lot of work in, in order to do well. Because I think last year he would, I mean, I'm also taking a bit of drive to survive and to consideration that he really didn't care last year. He was really slacking in terms of stuff and then he really overpushed the car. But I think this year he's really starting to see glimpses of maturity. He's actually starting to realize how much work he's got to put in in order to perform. And I think this last weekend was really an example of that. Yeah. And I mean, Bethany, I think one thing that em- or exemplifies that is that at the start of the race, Yuki was forced onto the grass, I think, by uh, Mick Schumacher before he had his spin. But last season, you probably would have seen him swearing and blinding on the radio, like he, we saw yeah. in Imola last year. Mm. This season, quite cool, quite calm, quite collected. Do you think that that change in mentality has taken place and that with that, he will start to perform? Because at the moment, he's ahead of his teammate in the World Championship. Yeah, I... I, I'll be honest, I'm still shocked about Duke Snow managing to come up to 7th from 16th. But yes, cause he just flew under the radar for me uh, quite a bit. It was like, hang on, how did he get there? <laughs> but yeah, I think that he's become much more mature this season. And I feel like those glimpses of brilliance that we saw last year in... Bahrain and in Abu Dhabi, we're seeing, we're already seeing them more this year, and I think that he's just improving in his consistency most of all, and I think that's a big thing that's helping him. I do agree. I think he's become a lot more consistent, and throughout the season, we'll see. I think we'll see him grow as a driver. We can see him maybe if the Alpha Tauri gets better, like challenge for higher top ten finishes. I'm not going to say a podium, but challenge up there. My concern is what the Alpha Tauri do next year. Because they might, at the end of the season, in theory, have, a, obviously, a really good Pierre Gasly, no matter how off form he may be sometimes. He is still a top driver, and no one should forget that or underestimate that. And they'll have Yuki Tsunoda that's performing really well and has grown a lot, and that progress will be inevitable. So what are they going to do? Are they going to keep with those two for another season? Or are they going to have to let some of them go in hope that other teams will pick them up but if we don't we're not going to get a new team in four next year and there's already rumours of silly season going round I've seen so much happening but I'm worried not I am worried that one of them will lose a seat for next year and I don't think that should be the case but with new drivers coming in so Porsche will, is very likely to get a seat and possibly Liam Lawson could come up to that AlphaTauri seat who's going to lose out we might see some big names not part of the grid next year well, hopefully Sonoda keeps doing well, especially for my fantasy team. I'd like to shout out my third place finish this week. Congratulations. The, uh, the, uh, my second team still did better, though. How it is w- that the case? I don't know. It was three points better. It, it keeps annoying me because it's about 80 points better off just than my first team. Just deliberately make that team worse or just change around your people. You can do transfers. No, I think my team's good. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know how. It's because I've got Russell in it. It's just I, I put Russell in because I thought yeah, he might finish some places. He's had. He's the most consistent driver at the moment. It's very annoying. But we'll move on to one final team that we need to talk about. Aston Martin, with their five points, um, I think it is now the earliest in the year or earliest by rounds that every team has scored points in F1 history. Four beating five in 2017. 
Very, very good stat, Will. It was. I, that's just something I thought about and then Googled. <laughs> Encyclopedia of Formula One here. Exactly. Yeah. So, yes, five points for Aston Martin. We discussed, obviously, Chime in, um, in the Australian show how William, that one point for Williams might be crucial in their battle. And then Aston Martin, two weeks later, go and get five of them. Do you think that this was just a one-off? Obviously, Vettel getting that eighth place, even Lance Stroll finishing in tenth. Do you think that it was a one-off, or do you think they bought some upgrades that may have made the car a bit better? May bought some upgrades, I think, this weekend. But uh, um, it's going to be, that's pretty much too difficult to tell with Aston Martin, because Williams... Was they got tenth last week, and then they still then got out of the points a lot this this week. So Alford was only eleventh. That's true, but but Latifi again was lower. <laughs> did you what a surprise? Did you want to throw out that fun stat we were talking about during during the break about how only Verstappen and Latifi uh, have, yes. have finished in their same positions? So Verstappen either DNFing or winning, Latifi either DNFing or coming 16th. I believe that's this season, yeah. And Latifi hasn't spun when Verstappen's been leading a race. Conspiracy. So, big conspiracy, Latifi wants that second Red Bull to see. <laughs> Latifi to Red Bull 2023. But no, Aston Martin doing very well this week. And we will finish off the conversation about the race here. Anyone else want to add anything quickly? Any other? Very far. If we're on the verge of stats at the moment, since the start of 2020... When Max Verstappen has raced in Italy, he's either won the race or he's retired. Ooh. Verstappen Ooh. just thought I'd throw that out there. Well, since about 2019, either Verstappen has finished on the podium or retired. I, I, I saw one stat where it's been, I think there's only been three races that he's finished in the last 50 that he's not been on the podium, yeah. which speaks a lot of that the consistency, which given, go go back to 2018, go back to Monaco 2018, mm. the Ricardo Verstappen crash at Baku, his crash in FP3, and all of the, it felt like the vultures were closing in on Verstappen. He has been uber consistent since then he's either a hero or zero we'll take one <laughs> final we'll take one final break and we will come back and talk about the Miami Grand Prix and also look at our predictions which spoiler alert were not very good Welcome back to the final segment of the Warwick F1 show and we are jumping in to the Miami Grand Prix the first race ever in Miami. Their marina looks terrible. That's the only thing I have to say. I mean, I'll just throw it around to you quickly before we come on to our predictions. Do you think we will have a good race? Do yes. you like the look of the track? Yes. Yes. Because if someone's got a crash, they'll be over ambitious. Someone's got a crash. Some a random Canadian. That we also, I've seen an race. onboard or a fake onboard. It does actually look pretty good, even though the track may not be the most amazing. I think it, the scenery is pretty cool. I like palm trees. Yeah, no, I, I thought Miami came in for a bit of un, undeserved slack when it came to the track. I think the track actually looks quite good. I mean, Formula One racing in a car park around an infrastructure in the United States. That's, now, what was, what's the history with that? Never gone wrong before. Never gone wrong before. <laughs> never heard about that. The, the minute anyone puts a race in a car park, it's just automatically going to be terrible. And I think, look, this race is for the spectacle. It's a destination race. Liberty do not care if the race is good. What they care about is how much money they can make from it and how good the fan experience is and how many Florida natives they can get to sing over the weekend. That's all they care about. Stop spoiling our predictions. Well, no, I was just thinking they'll be doing big concerts off the track and all that. Yeah. That's what that race is about. Oh, and maybe showing off Miami as well, because why not? Because no one's ever heard of Miami before. Hmm. Where is Miami? No, I know what I no, <laughs> I was going to say. That one didn't land. That was way too serious yeah. with that delivery. I mean, Jimmy, did you want to add something quickly? No, not really. It just, I'm, I'm just really not looking for, for how obnoxious and how overly American this race might be. Oh, this is going to be I mean, if we, we know what Cota's like. I, lo- I mean, I love No, Kota, Kota's but... like the good side. Kota's like the barbecue truck yeah. side of America. This is going to be like the toxic Instagram <laughs> side of America. <laughs> and we've got, we've got two US races this year. We've got three of them next year. 
I'm guess. fine. I'm actually fine with having, them having three races. I'm so good at rock up to the race we in red, white, and blue. Because it's basically, <laughs> it is like, they, they've always had the European America comparison. They're very similar, mm. and Europe gets 11, USA can have three. Chime, do we want to go on to our predictions? Yes. Or we'll start with what we said for Imla, as I was saying before the break. We weren't very good. Yeah. I mean, approaching Umula, uh, Will had a pretty big lead. He was 11-7 already. But, um, yeah. But for Imola, I think in terms of the podiums, we were both pretty horrible. We both, uh, I said Signs to win and you said Leclerc to win. Obviously, neither of the Ferraris made it to the podium. Um, for second and third place, we both exactly, we, we both put Verstappen Hamilton. So we both get one point for having Verstappen, even though he was, he actually won the race, not second. Gives us three points for a win. So you, so Correct. you went DNF. And so the actual position was DNF win 13th. I yes. went 6th win 13th. Yeah. We're good at Good this. set. Good <laughs> set. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then for our one point, our safe predictions, our one point, I said there'll be at least two red flags in either the sprint or the Sunday. I did not say qualifying, which I'm, just, I'm so, I'm so annoyed about. And then you said signs without qualify Perez, but unfortunately signs did crash out in Q2. So. Right. Your safe predictions were the opposite of safe. <laughs> yeah. But they were safe at the yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. For our medium, I put, I put signs without qualify Leclerc, but like we just said, he crashed in Q2. And then you said one of the big six between Mercedes, Ferrari, and Red Bull would DNF in the sprint race. And none of them did. I chose the wrong one, Will. Yeah. No, for science. Sprint, I said sprint. No, science, no, science, science managed to DNF in every session that wasn't the sprint race. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I remember correctly, nobody DNF'd in the sprint race. Uh, Joe. 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 I thought that was a qualifying crash. No, no, no. no oh, okay. And then for our three pointer, which is what I'm happy about, you said that exactly uh, eighth position will be a McLaren, uh, ninth position will be an Alpha Tari, and tenth will be an Alpha, Alpha Romeo. None of those. Are but right. it was, um, I think, if I'm saying an Aston, a Haas, and an Aston. Yeah. Sorry, so very, very good, very yeah. good oh, sorry, set of because we all predicted a double <laughs> Aston Martin yeah. points could finish. <laughs> Whereas, well, at least on the good side, I said that no Red Bull engine would DNF on either the sprint or the Sunday, which none of them did. So I think I was quite generous giving you a yeah. three-point three prediction. But especially there, but knowing they're... I allowed it, yeah. so Especially points. knowing they're reliability. Yeah. So that makes it 12 to 11? Yes, 12 to 11 to you still. Yes. Tight. You, it is. You've tightened up. Four races in. Right. Three sets of predictions because we missed, we missed one. Because yeah. <laughs> I was in Czech Republic and <laughs> having a great time I was having a great time uh, but now we will do our predictions for this upcoming Miami Grand Prix I've gone with Cam you have gone with Catch and Bethany do you want to start with your top three alright I've gone I've gone pretty safe with the top two Leclerc and Verstappen is pretty on I don't see any of them crashing out in Miami and then for our third place we went for Russell Ooh, for okay we were thinking about which drivers do well when there's new tracks, and our first thought was Lewis Hamilton. Then we thought, oh wait, this is 2022. So then we went with George Russell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we went exceptionally safe with Verstappen, Leclerc, and Perez. I don't think. Yeah. Although, mind you, if we had Jolie and Palmer, given that he is the man who taught us to be alert on a street circuit, he would have gone into that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I always love watching back, was it Singapore 2017, when yeah. Jolie and Palmer overtakes a Mercedes in arguably one of their most <laughs> dominant periods of the top three in, like, F1 history. Jolie and Palmer just goes around the outside of Bottas. Great! It was, that was he, he was he never got the chances he deserved, Jolie and Palmer. Mm. Well, I mean, I was looking when I was researching for when I was researching for the stat about points finishes. Sauber got their points at the fifth race. In that race, only the top three won laps, <laughs> and Ricardo. So Hamilton and um, Hamilton and Vettel were four seconds apart. Ricardo was a minute and fifteen seconds behind. That is two. mega. And, oh anyway, we have to get the rest yep. of these predictions yeah. done because we'll we get kicked out soon. Well, yeah. I can't fit it into an hour. There's just so <laughs> much to talk about. But no, we'll do our predictions quickly. Do you want to start with your one, two, and three? Yeah, my one point will be a Danny Ricardo wears American themed clothing at some point in the weekend. <laughs> Going to happen. Um, our second place would be Guani Joe points. No. And then our third will be Pierre Gasly reaches Q3. 
because yeah, Alpha Tower is pretty much Alpha not reached Keith at all, and they're not really up with the pace. Yep, and we'll do ours quickly. Uh, while one point is it is a good race, and we will judge it when we get to the next. That's race. so ambiguous. It's, it's a, a no, good race. Well, it's a, it's got to be a general consensus yeah, from yeah. the people on the show that it was a good race. Yeah, that um, makes sense. I guess <laughs> two points. Uh, the red, a red flag during the race and three points national anthem is sung by Camilla Caballo I'm going to go with you're going Cam- Camilla we, Caballo moves to it. Miami young American okay. well no she's technically Cuban but she's moved to Miami big in the American market and also why not get back at Shawn Mendes <laughs> they broke up amicably I swear I mean, they're writing songs slating each other, so. Oh, are they? I don't listen to them. <laughs> uh, well, that has been, that has been the show. Thank you for coming on to my guests. Any last words? Quickly. It's gonna, be, well, we're going to Miami. Mm. Miami Vice, Miami Star. Because America. I yeah. Do. Looking forward to it. Let's hope it's a good race. Yeah. And why have they got that marina? I don't know. They're Very true. Vibes. Uh, but we will be back next week. Pro- uh, not on Monday because unfortunately the SU is closed because they don't work on bank holidays. So we'll be back sometime next week. Uh, Chime will be hosting. And then in two weeks, we will be moving on to looking at the Miami Grand Prix.